Great. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, do keep that passage open up um, in front of you. And uh, but as as we um, start, I'm just going to pray and ask for God's help. Uh, so let's pray. Here's some words from Psalm 24. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. Father, when we when we read those words and we look at our hearts and our lives, we we see how far short we fall of that standard. And yet at the same time, we see your incredible grace that makes it possible for our hearts to be cleansed. Um, and we pray that this morning, as we look at as your word together, we pray that you would um, help us to, to see the gospel, help us to see your grace, your mercy in fresh ways. So, Lord, thank you that you are the God who speaks, and we pray that you would open up your word to us now. Um, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Great. Well, as the saying goes, um, appearances can be deceptive. I'm sure you've heard that many times. And chances are that most of us here could call to mind some instance in your life or uh, of, of, of that being borne out. Um, appearances can be deceptive. I can remember my dad telling me a story. Um, this was way back in the days when mobile phones were rare things, rare as hen's teeth. Um, back in the days when batteries of mobile phones were the size of suitcases. Um, maybe some of you, that's like, what? Haven't we always had mobile phones? But uh, anyway, so I can remember my dad telling me um, he worked in central London and would commute in on the train. And uh, he, he, he told me a story about one particular commute home from work. There was, a, there was a guy who was having a very loud and very unimportant conversation on a mobile phone. He was speaking to his wife, I think, and, and kind of saying that he wanted peas with his dinner or that's, that sort of thing. <laughs> anyway, a little while later, there was, there was an emergency situation in the carriage for one of the other passengers. And so the other passengers were saying to this guy, look, can we use your phone to, to make a call? It's, it's an emergency, we need to use your phone. And, and this guy refused and he kept on refusing. They kept on asking, look, look, this is an emergency, we need to use your phone. What's going, why can't we use your phone? And this guy very sheepishly admitted that it wasn't a real phone. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Uh, amazing. So this guy, he wanted to have the appearance of someone who was wealthy and successful. He wanted that appearance so much, he was willing to go to these ridiculous extremes. Well, we live in a world that is all about image, isn't it? It's, it's all about appearances. Maybe you see that impulse yourself. Um, that impulse to project a certain image to people around you. Maybe the image you want to project is that you're successful um, or that you're a good parent or that you're a good friend or a good citizen, whatever it may be. Um, we all find that impulse sometimes and those things are, are good things. But the trouble is sometimes we want we can want people to see us being those things, appearing to be that appearance. We, we want that more than actually wanting to be those things in reality ourselves. Well, appearances being deceptive is right at the heart of the passage that we've just had read to us this morning, isn't it? Actually, the word seeing um, or derivations of it occur throughout the, the, the entire passage. It's even right there in, in verse one. 
Um, I have seen uh, one of Jesse's sons who will be the next king. I've chosen um, our translation has. So right throughout this passage, this idea of seeing appearance, it's all there. And if you have a look at verse seven, you'll see that word there four times in one verse. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord sees not as man sees. Man sees the outward appearance. The Lord sees the heart. They're really profound words, aren't they? And they're important words for us today, and not least because of in, in recent months, um, you may well be, be aware, high profile, well-respected Christian leaders and, and international speakers who've had the appearance of being godly men doing a great job for the Lord have turned out in reality to be leading double lives and committing horrific abuses. And it's been heartbreaking and sobering for many. So we need to hear these words from this verse, from this chapter this morning. And we'll unpack verse 7 uh, and the implications of, of verse 7 in a moment. But to start off, off with, we need, we need to put this chapter into the, the wider context of, of 1 Samuel. Now you may remember back in, in chapter 8 of 1 Samuel, the people coming to Samuel asking for a king so they can be like the nations around them. Up to that point, God had raised up uh, leaders or, or judges whom he'd anointed with his spirit to deliver his people. If you look through the book of Judges, you see a, a kind of downward spiral, if you like, of 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 rebellion God's people rebelling against God and the judgment that God brings their repentance and they're crying out to God for deliverance and him raising up a leader a judge to deliver them and then that cycle just continuing and continuing and continuing well the people decided that they want a king and actually what's if you dig down below that the reality is that they rejected God as their king. Actually, it was he who had heard their cries again and again and, and delivered them from, from their enemies. It was he who'd protected them and provided for them. But they'd rejected him. They'd rejected him as their king. And they'd rejected their identity as his people too, instead of being a light to the nations to show the abundant blessings of, of, of life with God at the center, instead of being a light to the nations, they want to be like the nations instead. And so Port Saul becomes their first king. And he's tall, he's impressive. He even shows some signs of, of humility. But as we've seen in our studies in 1 Samuel, he's the king they ask for, but he's not the king they need. And in these most recent chapters that we've been looking at, we've seen his, his arrogance and his disobedience, and we've seen him fail badly, particularly in, from chapters 13, 14, 15. So by the end of chapter 15, have a look at verse 35, 1 Samuel 15, 35. Um, Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him. And the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord regrets making Saul king. So that's where we we pick up in, in chapter chapter 16. The Lord has regretted making Saul king and Samuel is grieving. 
So chapter 16, in many ways, is a new beginning. It's a new beginning for Samuel. Maybe you can empathize with Samuel. Maybe, maybe you've walked through times of, of painful discouragements in, in ministry, in life, times that have been profoundly disappointing for you. What does the Lord say to him in verse one? Get your horn. Be on your way. It's time to start again. Uh, verse 1, chapter 16, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. It's a new beginning for Samuel, but it's a new beginning for God's people too. And whereas before they got the king that they asked for, this time, it's different, isn't it? This time, this is a king of, of God's choosing. It's a new beginning for them. And it's a really significant moment, actually. It, it's a massive moment in, in redemptive history, in kind of the, the history of, of uh, the story of, of the Bible. This is a pivotal moment as this king that God has chosen, his line will never be broken. And from his line will come the king of kings, the Lord Jesus himself. But we're getting ahead of ourselves, um, tempting as it is to, to do that. Let's get into the story. So be on your way the Lord says to Samuel. But verse two, we see that Samuel's not really jumping at the chance. Uh, he's, he's not jumping at the bit here because he realizes actually this is a dangerous mission that the Lord is, is calling him to. For, for him, the kingmaker, to be traveling around with his oil and his horn whilst there is still a king who is king who's not going to react well if he gets wind of, of what's going on. So we can sort of understand his reticence um, in a way, his, his fear. The Lord gives him a cover story, a kind of half deception to cover up uh, what, he's, what he's really there to be doing. And instead of an anointing, He's to invite Jesse and his sons to a sacrifice, the Lord says. So despite his, his, his fear about that, Samuel obeys, as he has done consistently throughout this book. Um, he obeys uh, and, uh, and does what the Lord says. And have a look down in verse 4. Verse 4. Samuel's not the only one showing some trepidation. When he arrives in Bethlehem, verse 4, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. And they asked, and, and they asked, do you come in peace? Presumably they can remember what he'd done to, to um, King Agag, uh, meeting out God's judgment. Um, literally, he hacked him to pieces. Um, RNIV says he just kind of covers it over and just says, you know, just put him to death. But literally, he hacked him to pieces. It was pretty brutal stuff. So you can understand these elders in Bethlehem seeing the prophet of the Lord coming to them. Ooh, what, why is he come to lowly old Bethlehem? Is he coming with more judgment? Samuel says, it's okay. Um, I come in peace, he says. And he tells them to get ready for the sacrifice, uh, to do all the kind of ritual uh, cleansings, etc., that they need to do to get ready for that. And he invites Jesse and his sons too, just as the Lord had told him. And the Lord had said that he was to anoint the one that he, the Lord, would, would indicate. And so in verse 6, he has one look at Eliab and he thinks, yes, this is the guy. Surely this is the guy. 
here he is, here's the new king, must be. It's not clear exactly what it is about him, but, but Samuel definitely thinks he has a kingly vibe. He's tall, perhaps he's strong, broad shoulders, impressive, handsome. But the Lord says, this is not what I'm paying attention to. All those external things, that's not what's important to me. What's important to me is a man's heart. Maybe we're thinking to ourselves, well, come on, Samuel. Remember how it worked out last time when you went with the impressive, tall-looking person? Come on, learn, your, learn the lessons. And, then, and so this kind of slightly awkward lineup continues. I imagine them all in, in descending height order, standing um, before him. And so Samuel get, goes through all seven. And the Lord hasn't confirmed or, or placed his anointing on any of them. And so it, he kind of awkwardly asks, um, Jesse, is this all, all of your sons? And Jesse said, well, there, there, there is one more, um, but he's out looking after the sheep. Samuel says, go get him. And notice we're not going to sit down and, until he's here. We can imagine that kind of awkward silence whilst they run off to the fields to find wherever David is and gets him back and him standing there. And it's quite a scene, isn't it? But just think about this for a moment. Um, this is an incredible moment. This would have been by far and away the most important meeting this family would have ever had. And David isn't invited. He's not given an invite to this. It's really striking, isn't it? It shows the low status that David has, even in his own family, that he's not invited. And yet, as we read in the story, as actually as is so often the way throughout the Bible story, the smallest, the weakest, the most insignificant, the, the humblest, is the one that the Lord lifts up. Just as we saw actually right at the start of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 2, in, with, with Hannah's song, um, picking up on, on exactly that thing, how the Lord lifts up the humble and brings down. So many of, of the themes in that song, actually, you can trace through uh, 1 and 2 Samuel. Um, so you can go and do that in your own time um, and I encourage you to do that and so the smallest the weakest the most insignificant the humblest youngest son David from insignificant Bethlehem is declared to be the one an anointed king in front of his family it's amazing isn't it um, over the next few weeks we'll we'll see more of the character of this king more of of his heart um in 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 action as as the story continues but notice in verse 13 this is significant as well so samuel took the horn of oil anointed him in the presence of his brothers and from that day on the spirit of the lord came powerfully upon david it's a stark contrast to Saul, whom the Lord rejected, um, and from whom the spirit of the Lord has departed. Actually, it's in stark contrast to, to all characters in the Old Testament story up to this point. Uh, often the spirit of the Lord rushes on people for particular, at particular times for particular purposes. But, but here... From that day on, the spirit of the Lord has come powerfully upon David. So, as I said, it's a it's a huge contrast to Saul, whom the Lord has rejected. And actually, the remainder of this chapter makes for pretty grim reading, doesn't it? And verse 14. 
Um, now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. It's a difficult verse, isn't it? It's uncomfortable reading. Actually, the, the language is, is very imprecise. So it's, it's hard to know for sure exactly what is meant by um, spirit here, an evil spirit from the Lord. In, in some other Old Testament passages, spirit is taken to mean something more like um, mood. And so there are some who, who suggest actually it's a bitter depression that takes Saul um, from, from here on in. But as I said, it's, 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 it's hard to be exactly clear on exactly what, what's, what's meant here. But what's not too difficult to, to get a sense of, and what seems hard to get away from here, is that this is a judgment from God on Saul for his sin and from his rebellion. Uncomfortable as that may be for us. But even in his judgment, we do see mercy and kindness for Saul as providentially David is provided uh, and, and his music in particular, his playing of the lyre is able to soothe the savage beast. Um, so this chapter, as we've said, is a hugely significant moment. Uh, it's a pivot point in the in the book of one Samuel. It's a pivot point in in the history of God's people and, and of salvation. But I want to come back to verse seven for the remainder of, of our time together. Uh, one Samuel 16, verse seven. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Really remarkable words. And there's two things I want to draw out as we as we kind of reflect on these words and think about the implications for them. And the first thing I want to, to draw out is, is the otherness of God, the otherness of God. To put it simply, God is not like us. God is not like us. That sounds like such a simple thing to say, um, but it's a, such an important thing to, to get into our heads. Because actually, I, I, we can have a tendency to, to assume that God is a bit like us and that he will react a bit like us and humans do to, to things that are going on. But the reality is, in Scripture, again and again and again, we see that our God is holy. He is set apart. He is perfect. He is infinite. He doesn't fly off the hang, uh, fly off the hand, uh, the, the handle in, in in rage. He's not petty or vindictive, like like we can so often be. Let's not bring him down to our level. So first, th this verse shows us the otherness of God. But secondly, and uh, mainly what we see is that with God, it's the heart that counts, not the externals. With God, it's the heart that matters, not the external appearances. Actually, throughout the Bible, um, there are many terms used to describe what's going on in the, the inner person, the, the inner man, if you like. So the Bible talks about mind and emotions, talks about our spirit, talks about soul, talks about our will. But there is one word that kind of ties all of those different things together in, in one single term. And that is the word heart, heart. When the Bible uses the word heart, it's a much richer sense than perhaps we might 
think on, on first glance. Heart in the Bible is um, the thing that at a fundamental level causes you to, to say what you say and do what you do. In other words, it's, it's our heart that shapes our behavior and our words. Our hearts shape our behavior and, and our words. So let's think about this a little bit more, um, particularly from what we've just seen here. God sees our hearts. He sees every thought of our heart, every interaction, every purpose, every desire, every motivation. There is nothing going on in, in your heart or my heart that God does not see and fully know. And God is not fooled by our success or our power. He's not fooled by, by how we appear. He's not fooled by our theological knowledge. He's not fooled by our worship. He's not fooled by our ministry, even. He's not interested in the externals. He wants your heart, my heart. He wants us to, to love him with all our heart. When Jesus was asked, what's the most important commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. It's what Jesus said. And as we've seen in 1 Samuel, the problem with Saul was that his heart was for himself. His heart was for himself. Chapter 13, verse 14. And the Lord says to Saul, but now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. The Lord will seek out a man after his own heart. The implications are that Saul, you're not after the Lord's heart. You're after your own heart. And that's what we see borne out in the narrative of 1 Samuel and as, as the story goes on. And actually, that's a pretty terrifying thought, isn't it? That the Lord sees and knows our hearts, that he's not fooled. Well, what hope is there for us? Well, the only hope that we have to stand before the God who searches hearts is that the eternal King of Kings descended from this shepherd King, uh, Jesus Christ. Our only hope, as we've sung already this morning, is, is in him. In him who, who came not to make a sacrifice, but to be a sacrifice so that we could be completely forgiven for every sin, past, present, future. So our hearts could be cleansed and made new so that his spirit could live within us and make us more like him. The remarkable thing is that he, he did it for us, knowing full well what our hearts are like knowing full well what our hearts are like, Jesus laid down his life, gave up his life for us, not being fooled by any of the external appearance stuff. He knows our hearts better than we do. And yet, whilst we were his enemies, he died for you and for me to win our hearts for him. So let me ask you as I finish, does he have your heart? Now, I don't sit here as somebody with 100% wholehearted, perfect allegiance to God 100% of the time. Far from it. There is a war going on in my heart every day. 
back to Saul and David, the, the fundamental difference between these two. Neither of them were perfect. The fundamental difference between these two. Saul's first love was Saul. Whereas David's was God. Albeit imperfectly, we'll see as we go through the ways that, that um, David um, failed spectacularly in, in some instances as well. The hero of, of, of these Old Testament stories is not David, but the Lord himself. But the difference between Saul and David, Saul's first love was Saul. David's first love was God. What's yours? And maybe building from that, who do you have in your life to ask you that question? To, to get beyond the, the kind of external appearances and to get into the nitty gritty and the reality of, of what's going in your, on, on in your heart before the Lord. Who's there? to ask you those questions because it seems to me that the scandals that have unraveled around high profile Christians living double lives and, and all that kind of thing uh, something that strikes me in in those cases is that they didn't have anyone asking them that question and that frankly they didn't have the humility to open themselves up to be vulnerable uh, to answer those questions either. So as we finish, um, who does that for you? To finish up, I want to read some um, verses from the book of Hebrews. I'm aware it's, it's challenging stuff that we've been thinking about, but I want to leave us with the hope of the gospel and the glory of uh, the Lord Jesus and what he's done for us. So let me read from Hebrews uh, chapter 10. The confidence that we can have now to come before the God who, who searches our hearts and knows us. Listen to these incredible words. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened up for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, having our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is such an incredible truth that we can have confidence to come before you into your holy presence, not because of anything that we have done, not because of anything that we are, but all because of your grace, all because of what your son the Lord Jesus, the good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep, all because of his grace, his love, the great love with which he's loved us. We can be confident before you. We can have our hearts cleansed and washed because of his blood that was shed for us. Would you help us, Father, to hold unswervingly to that great hope? Would you help us to spur one another on towards love and good deeds as a result of it? Would you help us to speak the truth to one another? Would you help us to fix our eyes on the Lord Jesus? 
and in his great name we ask it. Amen. Thanks, Tim.